morning, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Lear Confidential on learmedia.tv. And we have an email for your comments. It's info at learmedia.tv. And all our programs are up on our YouTube channel and our social platform, so you can catch them there. I'm delighted to welcome to the studio this morning Eric Nelligan and Sarah Beasley of Ian 2 Good morning, lads, and welcome. Good morning. And good morning back, Pat, to you too. Yeah, and indeed, um, Ian 2 as you know, is in existence over two years. Uh, it's a new political party here. Uh, it's a, a touch two county party. Actually, Eric, you might tell us what it is, really. You know, it's, it's said to me, because... <laughs> Why did you? Um, how, long, how long are you in the party? Um, I'm a member just over a year now. Um, I'd always been interested in the party. I suppose, look, like a lot of people, I I live my life. Um, I give out a lot about politics and what politicians did and didn't do. And then what really got me active in politics was coming up to the eight referendum, the repeal the eight or save the eight. I was on the save the eight side. Um, we put a lot of work into it, but ultimately we were on the losing side. But what bothered me the most about it was how the mainstream parties uh, treated and reacted to people that wanted to save the eight. Um, you saw how Padder in Padder was was pushed out of Padder to being the A2 party leader. He was pushed out of Sinn Fein. Life was made difficult for him, and it was the same. It was the same for politicians in Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, and other parties as well. So. I didn't like what happened there. I was heavily involved in Save the Eight. Um, and when that finished up, I saw what Padder was trying to do. I was approached to get involved in the party at the outset, but based on my family life and having put a lot of work into Save the Eight, I wasn't able to give that commitment. Yeah. But the longer things went on, the more I saw the good work that A2 and Padder and, and people locally were doing, I said, it is time for me to quit, be, quit being the hurler in the ditch, so to speak, and actually mm -hmm. get... Get, get, get involved and try and convince people that there is an alternative out there. And that's, that, that's what led me to aim to. I'd always been inclined towards the party. I like its core values, which I'm sure we'll discuss as we go on. Um, but I was very happy to be involved. And then through uh, Sarah and Limerick and other members, Philip, uh, I've been given an active role and I've kind of, within my own confines, within my own job and family life, I've Done as much as I, I do as much as I can to help the party to build a profile, to um, to make sure the A two word gets out as much as possible around. Yeah, and all all of that is very important anyway, you know. And uh, I'll just uh, and Sarah, what about you? How long are you involved with A two, Sarah? Um, I was um, involved with it before we even named it A two. Um, again, I was in Sinn Féin and um, I work, work, worked locally as a, the TD secretary here. Um, and I, to be honest, I hadn't been around in the previous uh, uh, referendums on the issue. But I found that um, it was something close to my heart living in the UK and seeing abortion on demand. And I just stepped up and said, I, I don't like this, guys. I don't think it's right. Um, and it became a very vicious environment. I'd never seen anything like it, you know. Um, it was like the civil war all over again. Um, yeah. And I had to stick up for my values, so I lost my job. Um, you know, I hit rock bottom because of my values, and, and myself and Pad were talking from the beginning. So we were actually cherish all the children before we became AIM 2. So... Um, I was asked to be involved in the officer board level, so I'm the national secretary of the party, which basically means that, um, you know, we look at decisions going on in the party, we look at policies, we agree, um, you know, where we put our stick in the sand and say that we're determined to make Ireland a better place because politics is toxic at the moment, toxic at the moment. Um, and you know the constituents are getting torn apart in the middle of it and that's how it shouldn't be so it's you know even dealing with people at local level um, other politicians will knock you and there's no need for it so we said from the outset we're not going to uh, we'll debate with people but we're not going to go into this um, 
uh, attacks that are happening locally in Limerick, especially between different political parties, we'll just focus on the issues and helping people, and that's it. And we don't get involved with them um, and little, you know, outside political <laughs> arguments. So uh, yeah. that's, that's my background to it all. It's easy to get distracted with with uh, things, and that's what they want you to do anyway. Because Eric, I, I'll ask you answer with Eric first. We have a T-shirt now without any power. We have a T-shirt now who's uh, who's overseeing a, um, a three-party government, and they're all doing their own thing. We have a T-shirt who's presiding over ministers who are not fit to serve in the government, and yet he's powerless to do anything about it. That's the way I see it. Would you? Um, Agree with that line. I see a minister. I see a Taoiseach who wants to hold on to power at all costs. Okay. He wants to be the man. He wants to be the man at the top table, and he is destroying his party. There is no intergovern intergovernment cohesion, from what I can see. Green Party do what they want. No one will hold them back. Fine Gael, as has been very evident over the past. Has it, uh, over the past couple of weeks with the catchings of the phone and the Marriengate affair, they can do what they want, and there's no there's no impunity, there's no oh, there's no repercussions. Yeah. And uh, Fianna Fall, okay, while well, look, <laughs> I, a few Fianna a few, a few Fianna Fall guys fell on their sword when they attended the God meeting, um, Derek Leary, but the same level of the same level of discipline is not being applied around the government. So it's a government that's staying together out of fear because they know if they go back to the people. That first of all, AIN2 have been increasing the polls. We will take a chunk of their vote. And um, other opposition parties, through not doing anything spectacular, are actually in line to do well, not because they're doing anything good or they have great policies, but simply because they are not a government that is failing, that is failing consistently for its people. Um, so yes, it, it's he's Michal Martin is a powerless Taoiseach and he's just he's plodding on through and hoping the government doesn't fall. And Sarah, what's your take on it? Do you think it's 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 really for a country that needs true leadership now at this particular time when uh, the decimation that has occurred over the last year and a half is has been brutal to communities and businesses and all and families. I, I read this morning there's a double shootings. There's three people dead from shooting in Kerry. Uh, this is uh, Wednesday, uh, just for people who might be, this is Wednesday, the 8th of September, we're doing this program. Three dead from shootings in Kerry, and a, and a man walked into a doctor's zone too. I was only up there yesterday in, in Mallow and shot himself as well, a 51-year-old man. When you see that desperation, that lack of hope, and you see the the the, uh, the carry-on of the T-shirt and the deputy T-shirt, the tarnished, I mean, really, they're utterly and totally out of touch. Yeah, uh, totally. I mean, I think Michal Martin, you know, politically wanted to be T-Shock at all costs. Um, and he, look, he'll go down in history most probably as being the weakest Fianna Fáil T-Shock, you know, but at the end of the day, he's sitting it out. Uh, the, the, the government is scared that the, in the next six months there could be an election. Um, and people will vote them out this time. I mean, you know, people that are Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael diehards, families that have been since the Civil War, they're even changing the way, you know, they don't want this, as you say, that mental health has suffered terribly. And um, yes, when I read the paper this morning and you just wonder what uh, happened in that family, in, you know, in Kerry, and then that story um, of the gentleman in Mallow and every single night the talking people down off the bridges in Limerick every single night and okay. there's no there's you know people have got themselves into debt there's no solution coming from the government you know where is when we uh our mortgage repayments where's that money going to come back from these you know the banks want the money back the credit unions will be looking for the money back yeah. um, and and that's you know the bottom line and there's no um, clear government guideline of where we're going to get out of this pandemic. There's nothing being put in place. There's no um, three-year plan or anything. They're just saying, oh, we have to go day by day. But they, if they can get the money uh, for some of the things that they have, then surely they should have the money um, out there to support families get out of this pandemic financially as well. 
Well, uh, Lear Confidence is a program, and I'm with Eric and Sarah from AIM2, which is uh, a 30, it's a 32 county Republican party, uh, Eric, is described in the literature. Is that with a big R? Right, is it? <laughs> um, look, we are Republican, we want a United Ireland. We push, we push United Ireland policies, but we won't, we, we, we won't, and it wouldn't be right to force unionists into a republic. So we need to come to a, a, a compromise and accommodation. We need to find, oh, there's my bell. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'll mute here for a second, Dan, cause we'll be talking here now, sorry about this. Oh yeah, we can edit that out, Eric, that's no problem. Perfect, so like I was saying, our, we wouldn't want to force Ulster Unionists into this country, but we need to come up with a mechanism to allow them willingly join. And um, people don't like change, but if we can make Ireland the best country it can be, if we can govern it right, if we can put policies that make Ireland an attractive place for people to live and work, well then the unionists, I think they will see that being uh, one million people in a seven million Ireland carries a lot more sway and influence than being one million people in a, what is it, 60 million people in the UK? So, yeah. uh, and like, if you ask the average person on the streets of the UK, what do they know about Ireland or the Northern Ireland? It's very little. Um, yeah. There was shot a couple of years ago, you might remember, the DUP offered support to the Tory government um, and to, to make sure it didn't collapse. And people in the North, and people in England were shocked at the policies of the DUP because they didn't know anything about them. So it's like, it's like our Northern Ireland isn't in the conscious of the vast majority of the English people. So for us, there should be an attractiveness to unionists, to joining Ireland, to coming, but we need to make it attractive for them. And we need to compromise. Um, we need to compromise, but we need to hold true to the Republican ideals, but also allow it be an attractive place for unionists to want to live and work and be part of our society. Now, Sarah, there, there have been a, a recent uh, yes, yes, uh, I, I'm trying to say, say, say this with a serious face on me. There's been yet another housing plan launched by yet another Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael minister. It really doesn't matter. Now, when I saw this latest housing plan, I like to read stuff. That's the nerve that I am. It's a shocking indictment of the lack of, of, of uh, appreciation of just get on and build houses like they do in other countries of people not this apartheid policy of affordable houses social houses houses for the rich houses for the middle class we're not an apartheid state but by god reading the housing document it looks like that to me anyway am i missing yeah. something sarah no like i've been doing housing now for 10 years in limerick and um seven years ago i predicted that it would get uh, worse but I never expected the pandemic to arrive so you know for two years some um, estates would be still being built some stopped they wouldn't open up the borders of houses in Limerick which is like 280 and rising because two more were boarded up yesterday um, you know and, and Dara uh, the minister was down yesterday and I saw where he went in Limerick and you know, he was with all his Fianna Fáil bodies and they're all saying, oh, this is brilliant, well done, well done. Um, if I'd known he'd been there, I'd have turned up and said, can I talk to you about the experience on the ground, the despair of people living in overcrowded houses, you know, some families with autistic children, the despair of living in overcrowded situations in a pandemic where, you know, maybe granny has COPD and they were terrified of bringing in the, the COVID. The despair of, um, you know, people still living at home in the 30s, highly educated, good jobs, can't get onto the housing ladder. It's despair. And yet this document has been launched as uh, this is going to resolve the issue. It won't. Um, and you know, the might as well rip that document up and start again. And that's what I was saying at the beginning, they can have all these billions for housing, and yet the mental health of people in Limerick is, you know, and around the country is at an all-time low. So yeah, they, yeah. Uh, uh, and it's any political party, when you look at any of the manifestos of housing, they're just not getting it right. 
Um, the opposition parties just want to put something in that they can deliver a house to every person, you know, over 21. That's not going to happen either. So, um, I, like you say, in other countries in Europe, they're getting it right. You know, they're getting city centre life. You know, you can go to Glasgow where years ago, um, some of the city areas where you could not walk down. Now it is just fabulous. The city centre is safe. People living in apartments, families are living in apartments right in the heart of Glasgow. It's policed well. Uh, so every, everything, again, has not been looked at correctly. Um, and this, this one of uh, unit houses and, that can no longer be built. True. You know? The housing situation, I walked up, we have our studios here and they're just around the corner and Henry Street Garden Station, and um, I we walked up the other evening from the railway station, if, you're, if people are familiar with Limerick, up Hyde Road and to the very top and back down again, and we counted 37 empty houses boarded up. It's a shameful indictment of not only the TDs, but the councils as well. What are they playing at? 37 empty houses and people sleeping on the streets and getting fed on the streets every night as yeah. we help out down again. What is wrong with people? Well, we put a freedom of information into the Minister for Housing as AIM2, and um, he said that the funding has come down from central government to open up those houses. So therefore, we're pushing on the council and saying, so the funding is here, and yet the houses are boarded up. And some of them, I've been into them, there was never need, a, a need for a board to be placed on one window. Um, but they're boarded up, and some of them are three or four years still boarded up. And we have um, a, a thing going around. I'm standing outside every boarded up house in Limerick, and I'm calling on Limerick City and County Council to open up our houses. And it's a campaign that we've been running now for nearly a year. And I think three houses have been opened up in all that time. And you know, I deal with the families in the hubs and the despair of living in hotels again in COVID, living in the hub again in COVID. The little children um, have no, they just live in a flat in an apartment within a hub. It's like a prison. And, um, and when we ring up, if we ring up the, no, and if we ring up the council and say, where are they on the list? There is no list. Can you imagine that? There is no list. Sarah, that's sorry, I think bringing up the council talking about the list is a, a not a waste of time. Yeah. You're either being lied to or you're being prodded, in my opinion. I live out in Shannon and it's the same crack goes on in every county council. They just don't care. I mean, there's a thousand, eleven hundred people employed by Clare County Council for a tiny county like the county I live in. And we have boarded up houses in all the towns around the place. I don't know. Eric, you have a bill. I know we're jumping around the place. We're trying to cover as much as we can. An All Ireland Representation Bill. What, what is that about? Well, before we move on to the representation, can I just mention just in the, the housing there? Um, yeah, yeah. And, and you, you, you touched a great point, Pat, when you were giving your introduction to it. It's another announcement, and it's not going to, it's, it's, it'll fail. We've had this for a decade. Uh, AIM2 got uh, figures on the freedom of, information, freedom of information very recently that showed that last year, in, 20, or in 2020, there was 5,000 social houses built. But the government had promised 12,000. Of So half, on a normal year, half of the amount of social housing that should have been built was actually completed. So for Limerick, because we're Limerick-based, um, that resulted in 100 or so social houses for Limerick, which is not a lot. But what's worse then is because of government decisions this year, by shutting down the building industry for critical housing for, I think it was almost four months from January to April, there were, up until July of this year, 11 social houses were built. Can you imagine that? 11 houses. And imagine the amount of people that are not only homeless, but are effectively without a house and they're living in rented accommodation or you have, um, you have immigrants coming in in direct provision or you have people that need to move to bigger houses. That is, that is a scandal. So 11 houses for six months of, um, of this year and 107 in all of Limerick last year. So that's to show that the government, they'll make this big announcement, we're going to spend four billion and build 30,000 houses a year. We can be guaranteed we'll be talking in five years time and half the number of houses they promised will be delivered. That's that's the way it has been consistently for Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael and the parties that have been in power. So sorry there for cutting across your... Uh... 
No bother. And uh, we're trying to get as much covered with the lads as possible. Do you have an all Ireland representative bill? I presume that's representative in government or, or to vote. Well, what it what it is is, and it's this kind of shows our Republican credentials, and and it shows that we're a new party. We want an all Ireland approach to things. We have so called Republican parties, Sinn Fein and Fianna Fáil, who have never made this effort. So we have a bill going through the door at the moment that will give speaking rights to politicians elected in Ulster. So in the six counties of Northern Ireland, if you're a politician uh, elected up there, you have the right to speak in the Dáil. Now, it is, we do not give them voting rights because we're two separate jurisdictions, unfortunately. Yeah, but yeah. What, it do, what it will do is it will allow Northern politicians from Northern Ireland to come down and, and express their views on items that have a cross-border uh, cross interest. And yes. Yes. A, lot of, a lot of people, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's true. That's I, I always thought that should be the case anyway. You know, that to understand the actual, what's all I'm talking about, to understand the issues I'm saying. The politicians that are on the ground in six counties would come into our elected doll and say, lads, this is what we're trying to deal with. This particular policy that you're pursuing will stop this good pro or whatever, whatever the case may be. And I think that's an excellent, I hope the bill, is the bill getting support? Uh, well, unfortunately, what, what you see is, what will happen is the bill will probably be taken by one of the larger parties. That's what has happened with a lot of us up. AIM2 have actually put out an awful lot of bills and maybe Sarah might speak later on about her animal welfare bills. So AIM2 put the idea out there. We get a little bit of coverage because we're a small party. Next thing, a couple of months later, one of the larger parties have the exact same bill with almost the exact same wording, put it through under their name, and they will, they will take the credit for it. Look, what is important is that uh, people up the, the north principle. get representation. And the principle of it, it would be great if a and were given the credit for it, and we will, of course, bang that drum, and we will highlight the hypocrisy of what's happened. But ultimately, yeah. if progress has been made, it's probably it's good for the country. Now, Sarah, I've been reading there where um, you're suggesting that someone who might steal a family pet should be, there should be, an, is it an automatic jail sentence? Jail term? It is. Um, now, again, this is, uh, my background is that I'm a veterinary nurse. And when I moved to Ireland 30 years ago, uh, look, it's a different place now, but animal welfare wasn't really... Uh, you know, at the forefront. And when I joined AIM2, it was something that I said to PADA, you know, we can all go off and get ideas and come back to PADA, um, which we, you can't do in other political parties, not at this level. And I said, look, PADA, animal welfare is my passion in life. And I said, the one thing I would be terrified is, is if that someone took or stole my dog. Um, she's not past the family. She is our family. Um, we all idolize her. And I think we've seen this increasingly in Irish society that dogs and cats have become part of the family. And during the lockdown especially, I was seeing um, a rise of dog thefts, whether it was here or in England, Wales, Scotland, because I follow a lot of the uh, dog kidnap um, posts um, on social media. So Paddy just said, well, listen, watch it. I said, look, a prison sentence. Now, I would say 10 years and we've had feedback from people saying, give them life. Um, but we had to be realistic to obviously get it into law. So uh, I went off with the barrister and we just produced um, a basic bill that says, if you go to court and you have stolen somebody else's um, pet or animal, be it even if it's a snake, if that's um, your gig, but that you face the consequences because, you know, people stealing horses people stealing dogs. I mean, especially out the countryside, they were marking, um, you know, gates and to indicate that there was maybe a high-end breed costing maybe 5,000. Yeah, so dogs yeah. now have become, you know, an item that costing more than a, you know, a 50 oh, TV. Um, and it's wrong um, on so many levels. So we just said, if, and if we are getting a lot of support and we're on to stage two, and I can be sure that uh, if anyone tries to steal that um, bill from AIM2, <laughs> I, will be on, uh, I will be on all social media saying it was ours. The concept 
We have a lot of animal welfare support. We have a lot of people that joined AIN2 because um, of our uh, animal welfare, because we also, in six months, created um, a puppy farming bill. And that's drawn a lot of people actually from the Green Party to us because they promised um, reforms for animal welfare and it's yet to emerge. So look, it's, it's really good that in a, a young fledgling party yeah. that if you yeah. believe something that we can go to our party leader and say, look, part of we think this is a really, it's not just to get, um, you know, airtime, it's to say that we really need to protect our family pets. Exactly. And also, I don't think the, the law or the courts take it seriously enough. I mean, animal cruelty, the whole issue of, around animal cruelty and animal welfare in general. I think, the, if uh, looking back at some of the horrific cases, they've been only facing fines. Yeah. Now, find, finding somebody who has plenty of money, you, you, know, you might as well do nothing really, you know. Obviously, taking the animals off of them would be the first priority and make sure they're safe. But... I don't think we take it seriously enough because I was looking at some programs in some states in the United States. I'll tell you, if you're involved in any way with mistreating animals, whether they're small or big, you're in serious, serious trouble with the law. You know, there's no there's no second chance there. When you have ministers going into court and advocating on behalf of their constituents who are brought up in animal cruelty, we're not going to mention. Yeah. The, her name here, you know, but everybody knows who we're talking about. It's a shocking, shocking yeah. thing to be, you know. Why you should advocate something who's been involved in cruelty over a long period of time is beyond me, you know. And, I mean, uh, yeah, the Safina Fall counsellor up in Cavan, I mean, he's been caught um, with dogs in appalling conditions, and um, this is the first time. And, uh, you know, I know I've seen signatures and petitions that they want that council to stand down. And people have gone to the tea shops department, no answer. Um, and, you know, it's not going to bear well for um, Fina Fall if they don't take this as a very serious thing, that their own councillor can actually have puppies in appalling conditions. Yeah. And, um, you know, in Limerick, we put a, a PQ into the Department of Agriculture. And shockingly, we don't have um, an ISPCA inspector in Limerick or the county because, would you believe, they were bullied um, out of the city and threatened with all types of things to them. And we're not going to get an ISPCA inspector in the foreseeable future. Um, and this is just the, the, the craziest thing ever. So all the other counties around us, you know, Kerry and Cork, they have a nice, and this is why the animal cruelty in Limerick is just rocketing. Um, and again, AIM2 got that information and other political parties locally ran with it in the Limerick leader. So it's just, it's, and, and that's when everyone, it doesn't matter where you're from uh, or which political party, surely animal cruelty is something that we could all say, we need to fight this together. Let's support this same 2 bill. Let's support Sarah, you know, talking about it. But no, um, you just shut down. Now, Eric, uh, getting on to recruitment, getting on to drive to get people to join the party. I know from the party that Padder initially was in, uh, they were very successful in the universities. I know that myself from first hand experience. And what about you? I know uh, what, uh, regarding bodies on the ground, it, it would be a huge undertaking. But ha how much inroads have been made at this stage? I know you're only two years in existence and you can't do everything together. You have to concentrate on the strengths that you have within the party, you know. But notwithstanding that, have you made any foray, say, into the UL and LIT and places like that, locally here in Limerick? Well, well what you got to remember, unfortunately, is AIM2 is in existence I, probably uh, January two years ago. So that's yes. uh, maybe 30 months. And we've spent probably 20 months out of the 30 months in, in pandemic restrictions. So that's our, right. our, ability, our ability our ability to get but, into... But the posters um, will go up, will they? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But what we have done is... We are locally, we have a, a very strong group of members locally who joined, um, who joined because they see the work we do. So yes. when, when we started off, a lot of people with pro-life credentials would have come across and joined the party. 
But since then, what we're seeing is people that have that want a better Ireland are joining. Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, I see where you're coming from there. That's that's very important. And also, Sarah, what about you? Do you, do you think that uh, I suppose we're coming out of the pandemic now? And uh, well, my opinion is only my opinion. I'm not a doctor. We've been out of it for a while, but we're we're trying to, uh, I suppose, get out of it in disentangle ourselves completely from this um, situation and get back to some semblance of normal living within the country. Yeah. And to that end, we'll be free then to say hello to people at doors and say hello to people at local meetings and all of that. So now, when Go this pandemic, uh, yeah, Eric, no worries. When this pandemic is over, Eric, since to finish your point, I suppose recruitment and stuff like that will be will be more easy yes. easier done. You know. We, yes, I mean, as well, um, we've had um, housing. Obviously, is um, something that I'm doing locally on the ground, and we've actually picked up a couple of members that never wouldn't even know what politics was, but just said, "Can we support you?" And I said, "Look, you know, join up, see what we do." We got locally six people join up just because of our animal welfare policies. So we're picking up people like that that would never have been in politics, but just said, you know, and, you know, we've got to look at the greyhound industry and stuff like that. And so we keep ploughing on. And this year we're having our first Ardesh, and that's the first two county Ardesh. And that's the first time we've all seen each other in a year or more. Um, so that's going to be a huge um well, I suppose, yeah, not quite because you could have the audition in the Marion Hotel. As a lot of people seem to have gathered there during the year, so there'll be loads of rooms. Yeah, and, and you can have as many as you like there, as far as I know, just tongue in cheek. <laughs> but, Eric, uh, before we finish up, looking down the road now, we're assuming at the end of next month of October, we're assuming that everything, we have to make an assumption, we have to be positive that everything will be back to normal. And obviously, Ian, too, will be looking like any other political party will be looking forward to next year because I have a very, very strong feeling that uh, there'll be a general election next year. I have no inside information. I have a, a gut feeling that there'll have to be a clear out one way or the other since we have a teacher with no power, uh, each party doing their own thing and everybody looking at it and aghast and wondering what in the name of God is going on. This will have to come to an end, this debacle. Maybe the Greens might pull the plug and uh, save their skin. I don't know myself. But Ian two themselves are, will be looking forward to a general election. Your Ardesh, is, is it planned? Yes, our Ardesh is planned for the 23rd of October. So we will be getting all our representatives. We have, I think we have nearly 50, between 45 and 50 local yeah. representatives all around the 32 counties. Um, it will be open to all our representatives. It will be open to members who have attended um, meetings. We've, we, we've been holding monthly Zoom meetings within Limerick and some yeah. of all our branches around. So members that have attended Zoom meetings will be uh, entitled to attend the Ardesh as well. And we will we will be starting to meet in person and discuss. So look, as, as, as people know, um, people that have been involved in working for the last year and a half, Zoom meetings can be a little bit limited, a little, little bit limited yeah, yeah. In, terms yeah. of, in terms of discussion. It's hard to get a real, it's hard, it's hard to get into, oh, it's hard to get into the, I don't Eric, uh, before, you might send me myself an email uh, on, the, on, the, on the information on the RDS so we, we'll be able to uh, talk about it then and uh, we'll come back again certainly after that and uh, wide up with a new shiny book of new bills to be put forward the Irish people. There. But really, I mean, you have one TD and five councillors between uh, six counties and here. Uh, three, is it three? Have we three local councillors here and one TD? Now, th that's a fair feat. I was saying to Sarah before we started the programme for a, a party that, um, I mean, it's it's an expensive, an expensive. We mustn't forget about the money as well. It takes money to to do anything, as I know myself, and we here in our media trying to get it off the ground, so it takes a lot of money and effort. And generally, as you know, Eric, it always falls on a few, a few people, and maybe a few more coming in, you know. But I'll tell you something: yourself and Sarah are fantastic advocates for the party. Anyway, there's no doubt about that. 
And indeed, from um, this edition of Lure Confidential, we really appreciate you coming in to talk to Sarah and Eric. And uh, we wish you all the very best in the future. And we'll catch up with you again after the Ardesh. You heard it here first. It's on 23rd of October, is it? Yeah. Perfect. And no, it's not on in the Marion Hotel. That was only a joke early on. Which is no, it's not. not. <laughs> but lads, from Sarah and Eric, it's been fantastic having you along, and we really appreciate it. Thank you very much from this edition of Lear Confidential. Until we meet again, goodbye and good luck, and the best of luck to you both. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pat.